Uh, welcome everyone. Uh, it, I am so excited about today. Um, we are going to discuss advancing a research agenda in chemistry education around diversity, equity, and inclusion. Um, and in order to do that, let me go ahead and introduce our panelists and then I'll tell you a little bit about kind of the schedule for today. So uh, let me start with uh, Ann Barry Hunter from CU Boulder, where she's the co-director of the Ethnography and Evaluation Research Center. Um, and she's a qualitative researcher uh, who's a co-editor of Talking About Leaving Revisited, which is going to begin our conversation today. Um, and then we have Ramon Bartholomew, who's an assistant professor of physics at University of Utah, where his research centers around equity and inclusion in physics and astronomy. And then we have Brian Dewsbury, who is an associate professor of biology at the University of Rhode Island, where his research centers around equity and community building in biology and then across STEM. And then finally, we have Zakia Wilson Kennedy, who is the Assistant Dean for Diversity and Inclusion and Associate Professor of Research in Chemistry Education at Louisiana State University, where her research focuses on broadening participation in STEM. And so, as I uh, said earlier, we're going to start this discussion with some of the results from talking about leaving revisited. Um, and then following some of those results and discussion, uh, the rest of our panelists are each gonna present on considerations regarding theory, methods, and interventions in this research domain. And then we're gonna switch to discussion where we have some questions that were provided by members of our community already. And there will also be space for questions from uh, attendees today. So, uh, this will be a bit more structured than some of the past couple webinars we've done. So if you have questions, put them in the chat. And then at the end, we're still going to have some time for you to unmute and voice those questions and get some discussion from um, our panelists. One thing that I want to kind of offer to frame this discussion is we're really focused on developing a research agenda. So. Uh, I want the questions that you all are proposing um, to surround how we carry out research in this domain and how we can do that effectively in chemistry education. So without further ado, why don't you start us off, Ann Barry? Let me get your... Terrific. Thank you, Elena, and um, everyone in our audience, thank you so much for attending today. Um, so um, I am going to start by talking about the consequences of weed out. And in findings from four of our component studies, we were able to identify both by their characteristics and their consequences, a subset of largely foundational courses commonly referred to by students, faculty, and advisors as weed out courses a term that is reputational, traditional, pervasive, and entirely unofficial. Next slide. There are three component studies and additional two collaborative studies comprising the overall talking about leaving revisited research study. And I'll describe these in, in just a moment. The data uh, first were gathered at six of the institutions that participated in the original study. And the study site institutions are representative of the different types of institutions of higher ed and typify STEM undergraduates education in the US. In this mixed methods research study, we included a national and institutional study of STEM field switching patterns. This involved a comparative review of evidence from two national data sets to estimate the current national rates of STEM persistence, relocation, and loss, whether by switching or dropping out of college. And then we looked at three different data sets um, to examine these. The National Beginning Postsecondary Student Longitudinal Study, 
data from the Higher Education Research Institute at UCLA. And Tim Weston undertook a study of student transcript and attribute data to explore the switching and persistence patterns of STEM majors at the six institutions in our study sample. And it's this last data set um, that we're gonna be discussing today. Um, next, um, as part of the Gateway course taking study, the student assessment of their learning gains or SALG survey was in, administered online at the end of the term and a matched set of 71 STEM foundation courses across our STEM institutions. And then for the interview study, um, this study replicates and augments the original um, study um, for which this, we, that we replicated um, using ethnographic analyses of verbatim transcripts from interviews and focus groups with structured samples of students across the six participating institutions. And our broad purposes were to explore what has and has not changed in what causes switching and relocation and what enables persistence and to learn whether 20 years later, there are new factors affecting students' decisions to switch from their STEM majors. Overall, we interviewed uh, 96 switchers, largely juniors, and 250 persisting seniors across the most common STEM majors. Finally, um, findings presented in the current study, um, next draw upon two concurrent collaborative studies uh, one, a classroom observation led by Joe Farrar um, in the same 71 gateway courses in which the SALG survey was administered. Um, and he used the teaching dimension observation protocol to capture types of teaching um, and faculty student interaction. Uh, the second is a study by Andrew Koch and Brent Drake from Gardner Institute of DFWI rates. Um, that's a study of courses where there are high rates of grades of Ds and Fs and high rates of student withdrawals. And the study looked at four foundation level STEM courses at 36 institutions. And this study aligns with our institutional data analysis of DFWI rates. And the two studies triangulate in presenting the impact of severe foundation courses on persistence for particular student demographics, which, which I will be discussing. So it's results from um, the second collaborative study here that we'll also be discussing today, um, in addition to Tim Weston's transcript study. So as a, a quick overview of results from talking about leaving revisited, um, we found the core reasons for student switching decisions were largely unchanged from 20 years ago, with students citing the negative effects of aspects of STEM learning experiences. Um, as reasons for switching. So um, students cited uh, problems with STEM instructor pedagogy. These were slightly greater than reported in the first study. Uh, today, nearly half of switchers mentioned it as a reason for leaving their major. However, problems with poor teaching was a concern for virtually all students who switched and for nearly three quarters of persisting seniors. Problems with STEM curricular design uh, notably content overload, over fast pace delivery, and poor alignment between course elements. These issues contributed to leaving decisions for a comparable proportion of switchers then and now. In the current study, however, we found that problems with STEM curricular design affects far more switchers overall, and that these same issues are also problematic for over half of students persisting in their STEM majors. Under preparation was reported as a factor in student switching decisions in similar proportions in both studies, but more switchers in the current study cited under preparation as critical in these difficulties um, than in the original study. Uh, conceptual difficulties played only a small role in decisions to leave STEM majors um, in both studies, but concerns 80% uh, of all switchers today and we think that this, is a, this finding is related to the high incidence of poor high school preparations that, student, uh, that our students reported. Finding and accessing timely appropriate help was often critical to persistence. We found this is a serious problem then and now in the current study, um, 
problems finding and accessing timely help was an issue affecting a large majority of all switchers and about one third of persisters. Um, loss of interest related to poor learning experiences and foundation courses. This factor ranked first in the original study as a reason for switching. And at third place in the current study, it still ranks highly in switching decisions today. And loss of interest in incoming motivation affected nearly two thirds of all switchers then and now. So each of these factors contributed to weed out losses, which also remained unchanged, affecting over one third of students' decisions to switch from a STEM major. All of these factors represent the tip of our metaphorical iceberg, emphasizing that these issues affected students who were persisting in their STEM majors, not just those who made the decision to leave. So questions that I will address with this presentation are, what distinguishes weed out courses from other foundational courses? What distinctive patterns of grades and DFWIs are evident in weed out courses? And what consequences for student persistence decisions are evident in our analyses? To answer these questions, uh, we will draw on the four data site, uh, sources that I described, uh, the persistence study with uh, interviews with students, the end of course SALG uh, survey responses and the introductory gateway courses, the nearly million and a half student transcripts collected at six institutions, and then um, data from the 32 institutions participating in the gateway study, um, including 1.2 million to student transcript records gathered and analyzed um, by Brent Drake and Drew Koch of the Gardner, Gardner Institute. So again, just to say there's a lot of data backing up these findings, both qualitative um, and quantitative to triangulate and put this all together. Um, so I want to start with beginning with um, the interview study and our um, interviews with the 346 students and uh, their responses also to the SALG survey questions. Um, and uh, similar proportions of both switchers and persisters consistently identified weed out courses by the same characteristics. Weed out teaching methods also typify the distinction between the intrinsic hardness of complex concepts and hardness that is constructed as an artifact of the structure, teaching, testing, and grading methods used. Constructed hardness is evident, for example, in the characteristic most commonly cited by both switchers and persisters, that assessments are routinely misaligned with content and do not test students' actual level of understanding. Steeply curved grading also exacerbates the negative effects of such tests and fosters a destructive competitive student culture. The combined effect of these methods dissipates students' confidence and incoming interest and quickly exposes deficiencies in high school preparation. Students interpreted weed out instructor practices as a deliberate ploy to fail or discourage a predetermined proportion of students from continuing in either a STEM major or other majors that include STEM course requirements. And they may well be right. In both this and in the original Talking About Leaving study published in 1997, students reported the same speech being delivered in engineering colleges. Here it is, then and now. Look to your left, look to your right, two of you won't be here next year. In our new study, 35% of switching decisions derived from weed out course experiences, just as they did two decades ago. In both studies, switching uh, rates followed, courses were consistent despite institutional or cohort variations in academic capacity of incoming students. So I'll just repeat that again. In both studies, switching rates following weed out courses were consistent despite institutional or cohort variations in the academic capacity of incoming students. There are observations on this phenomenon by two high math students. 
one a senior, the other a switcher. Here we have, they do, uh, it doesn't matter how good the students are that enter, they are going to come up with a requisite number of C's and D's. There's no sense trying to help students understand things and do well. The mentality is we mark down and fail 30%. The other student, every single class it was, let's try and cut off another row of students. You come in used to high school teachers that want to figure out how to get you to understand something. That changes to last man standing will make it to the major. We were also able to identify weed out courses and distinguish them from other foundational courses by objective measures. These findings are from Tim Weston who conducted both the SALG and the Institutional Records Study for talking about leaving revisited and from Duke, Drew Crotch and Brent Drake who conducted the Gardner Institute Gateway Study. They each identified weed out courses, their characteristics and their outcomes. While only six institutions, there's an enormous amount of data, again, uh, with 45,000 undergraduate students across six different types of institutions. Um, we were able to acquire access to nearly one and a half million transcript records, including grades, classes taken, term by term current major, term and cumulative GPAs, SAT, ACT, math scores, demographics, and other academic variables. The term uh, severe foundational courses, or SFC, is used as a gloss to identify and define this type of course or class and to distinguish them from all other STEM foundation courses. Criteria for STEM foundation courses were, they required introductory or gateway courses where analysis of student transcript data for multiple years showed more than a 20% of students receiving DFWIs. They were typically large with over 100 students and most were in the first year, although some did come, come later. Weston found 68 courses meeting these criteria for weed out. Um, again, large foundational courses with a DFWI rate of 20% over multiple years. And this is what they look like. Here's the distribution of severe foundational courses from the transcript data analysis. You will see there are uh, three disciplines that are overrepresented, calculus, math, and chemistry at 22%. The Gardner definition for gateway courses was similar. Their classes were also foundational in nature and had large enrollments within or across sections. And they also produced high rates of D, F, W, and I grades. Uh, so using this definition, the Gardner Institute researchers uh, identified eight common gateway weed out courses. These included accounting, English, US history, psychology, and the STEM subjects, college algebra, college calculus, biology, and yes, chemistry. So uh, next I'll discuss the results of these studies regarding the consequences of weed out practices as found in both the talking about leaving and the gateway studies. Much of the evidence about DFWI and switching in our study comes from basic descriptive statistics, but it's important to note that this is correlational and not causal since we are not randomly assigning people to take weed out courses. However, getting a poor grade or an incomplete seems to play an important role in switching out of STEM. Here, the percentage of students switching majors doubles if you get one DFWI during the first year. The percentage of students switching increases again with two DFWIs received in severe foundational courses. Here is a view of the combined consequences of switching for gender and SAT, ACT math scores. SAT, ACT math scores are by themselves a predictor of switching. Students entering college with low math scores end up switching more than students with higher scores. Unfortunately, women also switch more than men. Even taking these variables into account, switching increases a lot for everyone with one DFWI. 
However, students with higher math scores still switch out at higher rates if they get a poor grade. The gap between men and women increases in this high scoring group with one DFWI. Gender, math, score, GPA, university, and major all contribute to the probability of switching. These factors also interact with the student's experience in severe foundational courses during the first year. Logistic regression gives the prob probability of switching holding all other variables constant and is used to examine the individual contribution of particular factors to switching. Logistic regression enables us to weigh and isolate the effect of each factor on the outcome, in this case, switching from a STEM major. From our model, we can estimate the risk of switching based on demographic and academic characteristics. In this model, we see 1D FWI in a severe foundational course uh, creates 5% greater percentage of switching. 2DFs uh, in a severe foundational course increases that to 10%. All of these combined as well. For instance, being a woman with one DFWI in a severe foundational course versus a man with one with none has a 10% greater chance of switching. Something to take note of is that being a student of color does not add risk in this model. In this model and others, other factors such as gender, standardized math scores, and grades do a better job of explaining switching than factors of race and ethnicity. In the Gardner study, STEM courses found to fit the weed out criteria were in algebra, calculus, biology, and chemistry. Here we see that nearly half of all students left following general chemistry here. What distinctive patterns of grades and DFWIs are evident in weed out courses for gender? As with most things in high education, the Drake and Koch's results show that females do better and have lower DFWI rates on average in all subjects. Patterns by race and ethnicity, students of color that have historically been marginalized in higher education, uh, always fare more poorly in weed out courses. African American, Native American, and Hispanic students demonstrate higher DFWI rates than their white counterparts in all four subjects. And you can see oftentimes their non-pass rate climbs to near 50% or above. Patterns by first generation and Pell Grants see this. Finally, here we show that students from lower social capital backgrounds do worse in weed out courses as well. Low income students and first generation students on average have higher DFWI rates than their non-PEL and non-first generation counterpoints. So the weed out system uh, has persisted for years. And so we must presume that it serves some valued functions. But teaching methods that are intended to weed out those presumed to be the least capable of continuing in STEM and STEM-related majors paradoxically produce consequences that are dysfunctional to such aims. Although STEM instructors and departments may not know it, these methods consistently ensure high and early loss rates among interested, capable, but socioeconomically and educationally disadvantaged students that include students of color. They exclude students with high ability who are disappointed with quality of weed out course science. Students with career aspirations other than an academic career in STEM disciplines and women of all race and ethnicities in all three categories. Thus, whatever beliefs sustain weed out courses seem not to be validated by their outcomes. Because the class, race, and gender biases in these, loss, in these losses, as well as the loss of very talented students, appear to be unknown to STEM instructors and their departments, we may presume they are unintentional. But of all our findings reported in talking about leaving revisited, we would argue that the pattern dysfunctional outcomes of the STEM weed out system 
point to the most urgent need for departmental, disciplinary, and institutional review and reconstruction of this form of teaching and learning assessment practices and the beliefs that perpetuate them. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ann Barry. I, this sure provides some motivation. <laughs> um, okay, so let's spend a little bit of time talking about how we can carry out investigations uh, to address some of this. And to start us off, Brian's gonna talk a little bit about some theoretical considerations when carrying out DEI research. Alina, remind me of my uh, time allotment? 10-ish uh, minutes. Oh, so not two hours? No, I can't. <laughs> All right, I'll, I'll, be, I'll be quick. Um, so thanks for being here. Thanks, Dr. Hunter, for that good introduction. Um, you know, what I'll do is uh, I'll, I'll tell you a bit about perhaps my own journey as a discipline-based education researcher uh, in the hopes that, you know, the ways in which we've approached the problem in my research program um, can help shed some light on considerations that pertain to, to Alina's question. Um, my name is Brian Dewsbury. I'm the PI of uh, uh, the Science Education and Society Research Program at the University of Rhode Island. Uh, we study basically the social context of learning. We look at uh, education broadly from kindergarten to adulthood, um, including in informal settings. And what we are interested in, what those external factors, some of which Dr. Hunter alluded to, um, what external factors are present that impact positively or negatively the readiness of a student to be excellent in the classroom and the readiness of a faculty member to deliver a high quality inclusive education experience. We take the position that in a, in a perfect situation, in a perfect iteration, um, both, both actors really want the best outcome from that relationship, right? So I don't, I, I don't believe that a student wakes up and says, what is the quickest way I can get an F in this class? <laughs> um, even though people may have a hard time believing that, but I don't believe that's the case. I also don't believe that most faculty members get up and say, I would like to fail as many students as possible. Now, if, if you're willing to be naive with me for a second and, and accept that as a premise, now we have to start asking different questions about what is this structure around both actors that doesn't allow them to be their best selves in that situation? So this is a complicated question, right? Because you're getting into things like the, the incentives associated with teaching, teacher development, teacher support, um, continuous professional development. From the student side, you're thinking about, you know, the, the entire history, the accumulated history they've brought to the classroom, good, bad, or in between. Um, so it's not as though the class begins and then all those things just disappear, right? The messages that they've brought from, from their secondary education, that they've brought from the communities, that they've brought from media, that they've brought from the economic circumstances, they all come to bear, they can be reinforced or mitigated in the classroom setting. I came, my, my PhD was in a STEM discipline. I was a, a marine ecology PhD. Um, I fell in love with teaching and um, made an, an intentional switch to focus on teaching and, and research of, of the scholarship of teaching and learning. And there are many people in my field, I think we are collectively called DIVA, discipline-based education researchers. And that title comes from this notion that our deep knowledge of the, the, the actual STEM discipline can be useful as we think about things like curriculum design and research questions around that. When, when we began in 2014, at least when my position began in 2014, I, I think there was a sense in the field, maybe it wasn't explicitly said, but it certainly was reflected in the nature of the publications that, was, that were coming out. I, I felt we tried to stemify everything. And, and what do I mean by that? I mean that we came with a lot of our quantitative methods, well honed, you know, very sophisticated, and I'm not critiquing the methods themselves. But sometimes methods can be taken out of context, right? And there was a sense where we can take all this academic grade data, all this GPA data, lump it into a regression model, and, and that sort of 0.2 GPA points increase would be the salvation for all of STEM teaching across the country. And 
So, so study after study was coming up with these, you know, these census categories of black, white, and Hispanic, and, and the grade data, and you know, the grades go up, the grades go down. And I would remember going to these presentations and thinking, but what does that represent, right? Who, who are the actual individuals in that classroom? And are you assuming that everybody in that, say, ethnic bin is behaving and acting and reacting the same in that educational environment? So that led, uh, at least my research group, to take, take a lot of steps back and ask questions that demanded, as Dr. Hunter said, a more qualitative approach. Right, asking and seeking out the student voice and being learning some, some really rigorous qualitative methods, collecting that data and, and hearing what each unique voice had to say, going through coding processes and, and, and quite frankly, um, having a kind of a slight preference um, for that way because that method uh, better privileges the student voice, I think, than some of, if you hear three year olds in the background, I have kids, I'm sorry, we're in a pandemic. Um, anyway. If uh, that kind of, um, those methods allow for the student voice to really influence not just the research questions, but the curriculum design in the classroom. Um, if pressed, I would have to tell you, um, we are mixed methods researchers. So there are times when we need that big data approach, when we're looking at long-term patterns, when we're looking at maybe trends across the institution. I'm not, I'm not uh, being critical of that method, um, but then there are times when we need to be patient and, and you know, use focus groups, do one-on-one -on -one interviews. We are big on reflection assignments as what we, you know, what's called in the field wise interventions and looking at what those wise interventions tell us about the ways in which students navigate the experience. My suggestion, I guess my advice in this context is to be prepared to be flexible. You know, education research is a, is a very interesting field compared to say like my past life as a marine ecologist, right? When I studied seagrasses and I added nitrogen pellets and phosphorus pellets to the seagrasses of Florida, I didn't really care what each individual seagrass felt like. I mean, it's, <laughs> right, this is, this is a pure, will you grow faster? Will you get eaten by a fish? Like this is a purely mechanistic enterprise, right? Did I enjoy it? Yes. Did I want to conserve the environment? Yes. but. There were very kind of specific methods and analyses associated with that kind of research question. When you're asking questions about human behavior in the classroom, when you're asking questions about education, you have to be prepared, I believe, to go down any one of a number of analytical rabbit holes. Some of your questions may demand collecting a lot of numerical and quantitative data. Some of your methods may require uh, uh, sophisticated qualitative analyses that, you know, reading text, analyzing text. Some of your methods, I mean, some of the papers we are writing now get into philosophy, right? We are looking at, at, at how things like uh, forgiveness and acknowledgement and, and how ancient scholars have thought about these principles, how that can uh, inform the ways in which you think about race education today, right? And quite honestly, it's a beautiful thing. <laughs> it's a beautiful thing to have a research program where we are you know, agnostic as far as what the methods are. It means sometimes we have to learn entirely new things or collaborate with, with you know, current scholars in the field, but the, the importance is not the method, the importance is not you know, uh, you know, whether it's quant or qual or whatever, the importance is the question. So let the question drive what you end up doing to get an answer to it. And this is why I was so excited to, well, you know, I read, uh, talking about leaving the first edition. I'm in the process of reading the second edition, but God damn it, Dr. Hunt, it's like 400 pages long. <laughs> so it's gonna, it's gonna take me a minute. Um, but, I, but I'm happy that this edition kind of has that qualitative aspect because you really sort of made both. So I'll stop there um, and you know take any follow-up questions after. Thanks, Alina. Thank you. Uh, I think that actually segues really nicely into a bit more discussion about methods. So take it away, Ramon. Happy to, thanks so much for having me. So I wanna talk a little bit about the research that we do in my group and, and how the methodologies we choose are a little bit different than what's traditionally done in physics education research and why I happen to think that they're a strong approach to take for some research questions. And I always like to start out with talking a little bit about who I am 
because that first row of stuff, you can see I did all my degrees in Michigan and that's the traditional academic path, right? Getting your PhD, going through a bunch of institutions. But the second row is what I did after I got my PhD, which is a little bit different than, than most scholars in STEM and even STEM education. Uh, first, I went to Finland and I did a Fulbright and learned about their K-12 system, which at the time was really the talk of the town when it comes to K-12 education. Then I did a stint at the US Department of Education where I worked with the Office of Civil Rights on communication pieces that would have gone nationwide to talk about how civil rights apply to STEM in the K-12 classroom, but the administration changed and all that work got shelved. And then I spent uh, my last few years in DC as a consultant um, at the Education Advisory Board. And it was at this point that I decided I actually wanted to be a professor and I wanted to do academic research again. But I only share this because my perspective is very different just because of the experiences uh, that I've had. You can see a map here of all the places I've uh, bounced around. And I also like to acknowledge that the research that I do is something that I don't do alone. I have an awesome team that I work with, um, really a unique group from many different backgrounds, scholastically and personally, and I'm thankful to all of them for uh, their support and work uh, looking at equity inclusion in physics. So, Physics for education research as a field is very diverse. It uses two broad kinds of research that was actually just mentioned by Dr. Dewsbury, being qualitative research, which is really the in-depth stuff, and also quantitative research, which is looking at <clears throat> statistical data, survey responses, institutional data sets. Actually, the, uh, the previous, previous talk by Dr. Hunter was a good illustration of a project that uses both. Our field is fairly small. <clears throat> And in recent years, we've thought more and more about the kinds of research that's been done and the kind of research that needs to be done in physics education research. And I think that this applies to ChemEd as well. And largely, when we look back to the turn of the century, we can see the stuff listed at the very top here that we looked at, conceptual understanding of physics, problem solving, looking at labs, application of mathematics. And we can flash forward 14 years and see the new stuff that started getting focused on teacher education, scaling up and sustainability of research supported instructional uh, strategies. And most importantly to me, thinking about uh, the achievement and success of students of color, women, LGBT, people with disabilities, first generation transfer students, and um, thinking about the role of physical and social environments in learning physics. However, when you look at the bulk of work that's being done in physics that looks at different groups from diverse backgrounds, it, it generally starts this way. And I think a lot of us have seen this. We get our graph, right? So this is a representation of physics specifically looking at women. And we get our graph and we go, okay, you know, this is the mark of the population, roughly 50%. And we see that women are underrepresented in all these fields. And then the research continues on after showing this difference and starts to talk about gaps. So it talks about differences in degree attainment, differences in concept inventory scores, differences in final grades, differences in course enrollment. And when you do a quick search of the literature, you see that this comes up quickly when looking at a uh, physical review, which is our, our tier one journal in our field. And statistically, this also reifies itself as well. In a review on gender research in PER, it was found that 80% of all papers looked at so-called gender gaps, which are these differences between men and women. But my colleagues and I uh, sought to explore this and, and understand this and, and think about it uh, a little bit more critically. And we found a number of concerns when thinking about research that focuses so heavily on gaps. The first and most important, which is that it really ignores all the socio-cultural factors that uh, need to be taken into account into people's lives. It also immediately sets up a deficit model. So it immediately takes the stance of, this is what men are doing, and this is what women need to do. This is what uh, white folks are doing. This is what people of color need to do. This is what people that are fully able to do, and this is what people with different abilities need to do, right? And it also, it also takes a binary model. Specifically, we're looking at gender today, but uh, you can do this with race and you can do this with ability and you can do this with sexual orientation, gender identity. But it assumes that we fit neatly into these separate categories and that there is no dispersion amongst them. But I think uh, one of the most uh, problematic aspects of gender gap research and gap research broadly is that when we look at the research instruments that are being used to collect data, they really actually haven't been broadly validated. The majority of the research tools that we use in physics education research come from uh, research intensive institutions like University of Washington, University of Colorado Boulder, University of Maryland, University of Maine. And all of uh, the majority of the studies have also been validated on calculus-based physics classes, which already is a population of students that skews male, oftentimes skews white, 
um, and also skews folks in the higher income distribution and that went to better high schools. So it actually doesn't reflect the diversity of students across the country, nor the diversity of students who actually take physics courses. Because when you look at the students who take physics courses, the broad majority are taking them in K-12 settings. And then in higher ed, the majority of folks are taking them in community college settings. So not at these rarefied R1 settings. And what does a survey uh, project look like that doesn't use gaps. So this is an example of one of uh, a collaboration I did with some folks at UCLA, including Dr. Linda Sachs. And we took a large national data set, which is the freshman survey uh, that has responses from across 1200 US institution. And it, and it tracks their intended major, their background, their goals, and also the values that they have. Overall, um, there have been over 4.5 million responses to the survey, and we took a much smaller subset to analyze. But what we did in this analysis is we did not compare women to men. Instead, we looked at women's experiences across the board and compared women to women. So thinking about women who major in STEM and women who don't major in STEM, women from certain backgrounds and women from other backgrounds. And what was interesting in looking at this data set across the 40 years is that from 1971 to 2013, the interest of women in physics essentially remains flat. Whereas we see an increase in interest of women in biology, we see an increase in dip in uh, computer science, and we at least see a little bit of increase in engineering. And it should be mentioned here that when we look at this graph, 1971 is when gender discrimination was literally legal, because this is before uh, Title IX, which, came, which uh, was amended to the, uh, um, to the Civil Rights Act in 1972. And we took a deeper dive into 65,000 of the respond respondents that intended to major in STEM and compared them to those that wanted to major in physics. So now we're just looking at women that are interested in science overall. And what are the differences between those that go into physics and those that uh, just go into a STEM major overall? And we found that there's a lot of positive factors for women that want to go into physics. It has to do with uh, uh, self-assessment of math, interest in uh, theory, but also interest in art interest in philosophy, and then we also saw this uh, trigger on folks not being religious. And what were the negative factors that predicted folks not going into uh, physics from the sample of women interested in STEM? So those interested in social activism, those that were status, trend, uh, status driven, extrinsic motivation, such as a paycheck, um, and those interested in a medical degree. And what this shows us is that we can look at women as a group without comparing them to men, and understand what interests them in the physics major and what doesn't interest them in the physics major, which communicates to us how we, we need to frame, market, and also change our physics major to be more inclusive of many students. And I'm just using this as an example of research that you can do that doesn't look at gaps. We could do this for people of color. We could do this for people with different abilities. We could do this for LGBT, first generation transfer. It really can apply across the board. And really, I'm on a mission to embed a lot of new ideas in physics education research. But the first and foremost that I want to do is reduce gap gazing. I want to step us away from the deficit thinking model, which there's many of my colleagues in education who have done this. I'm just trying to port it now into physics education research. I also want us to contextualize data and look at other factors such as race, income, national origin, et cetera, and understand our population dynamics fully in the application of the instruments we use, but also the results that we get. And last but not least, I want us to solve problems. I've seen many, many studies, my colleagues might agree with us, that point out the issues. And those are important foundational studies and we need them in order to have a foundation of what's actually going on. But we need to take it a step further and start looking at interventions. And we need to understand how we can actually make change and address these problems. So thank you for uh, listening to me talk a little bit about methods. Um, I appreciate your time. And I appreciate being invited to this important forum. And thank you for just like laying the groundwork for Zakia to sweep in. <laughs> so take it away. <laughs> Excellent. So um, it's so amazing to be on, on this um, panel with um, all of you all and to hear about the amazing work that you all are doing. When we were asked to introduce ourselves, we were asked our thoughts and ideas for advancing um, DEI research and chemistry education. And a good part of my work in the academy has focused on interventions. And so I'd like to share a scenario with you to start off our, our conversation. Um, last summer, so I'll read this scenario to you. Last summer I worked with a fantastic undergraduate mentee. She was very intelligent and generated a fair amount of data that was very useful for researching the group. 
I think she had a positive research experience, but there are a few questions that still linger in my mind. This particular mentee was an African-American woman from a small town. I always wondered how she felt on campus, uh, on the campus of a large urban research university. I also wondered how she felt about being the only African-American woman in our lab. In fact, she was the only African-American woman in our entire department that summer. I wanted to ask her how she felt, but I worried that it might be insensitive or politically incorrect to do so. I never asked. I still wondered how she felt and how those feelings may have affected her experience. If I were um, discussing this in a workshop, we'd really talk about this case in depth. Uh, but for our DEI um, discussion on research today, I wanted to, to pose a, a couple of questions for you to ponder. What was the quality of this educational training experience for the student? What was the quality of the experience for the faculty member? How do we design how to impact research experiences for undergraduate trainees? And are faculty knowledgeable about designing and supporting these high impact practices or experiences for undergraduate trainees from diverse backgrounds? What perspectives of faculty members dominate their impressions about how, individual, uh, how individuals navigate their research groups? What informal networks do students have access to during these types of summer experiences? Was the student able to access networks within the group department or beyond? How do we know? Do you have to be a DEI researcher to promote inclusive environments based on DEI evidence-based practice? How do we advance our studies and understand the lived experience of minoritized groups in our classrooms and research spaces and use this work to promote evidence-based practice? I think many of you all would, would agree that um, all of these are questions that are well aligned with the deeper goals um, outlined by the National Research Council. And these questions are particularly critical for that, that last deeper goal of identifying approaches to making science and um, engineering education both broad and inclusive. Additionally, we often think about these deeper related um, goals related to classroom practice and research. However, the most critical element of training in our discipline occurs both in classroom and research spaces. It is the learning um, in these experiences that influence the trajectory of students and the decisions of individuals to either persist or exit our disciplines. I believe that deeper research must investigate the learning experiences in both session, both um, settings. And so why is this important? Um, a few years ago, Hannah Valentine and Kate Lund and um, Allison Gammy in um, an article on CBE Life Sciences Education talked about a systems approach to increasing diversity in biomedical uh, research uh, workforce. And in this article, they suggested that we want to see dramatic changes in diversity. We must really evaluate our systems and understand how success outcomes are not only the result of the work and efforts of individuals, but also the environments in which they are operating and working. And so there's this need for a greater consciousness around the environmental factors, um, as Brian shared earlier, that are impacting the trajectory of, of individuals who are navigating the systems. And um, it's, it's a need for us to really delve into those practices and those norms that either lend themselves to inclusion or exclusion. I see myself as a scholarly administrator who's using DEI research to develop and study initiatives aimed at improving the lives of diverse groups. Um, and I'm especially interested in understanding the environments that individuals are navigating within our STEM disciplines. And so one of the things that I wanted to share with you all was an area of passion for me, which is the first year. So Ann Barry started talking about um, during her section, these weed out courses. And, and so many of them are the, the courses that students experience in the freshman year. It's a critical point for students um, of all backgrounds. I mean, we lose a tremendous number of students within the first year. And because it's this key entry point, we were very interested in my institution 
of learning and thinking through how we needed to develop a set of interventions with respond to our need um, for retaining students. We don't see the students leaving our disciplines as necessarily a bad thing. We believe in healthy attrition. We also believe in healthy um, retention. Um, healthy attrition occurs when students come in and they decide that they are interested in other areas. Um, unhealthy attrition happens when we have you know, fostering weed out mentalities amongst our faculty members and amongst our students. All right, so in 2017, we began an effort to understand the movement of students within our disciplines. To, due to time, I can't fully explain how we developed um, our initiative, but what I can share is that we pulled a lot of institutional data. We held faculty listening groups. We conducted an exit survey of students departing our majors, and we used other tools to identify what was needed um, in terms of the development of, of a freshman seminar course. We specifically designed it to address the climate felt by first year students um, with a focus on minority students. I can share that we had tons of students who came in with ACT scores of 24 to 29, who in theory had the, 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 the background to do well in our disciplines, but who were still exiting at, at very high numbers. And so we wanted to integrate strategy that promoted a sense of belonging that would build social agency and capital and that would support those students in navigating that critical juncture um, of transition to college. Concurrent with that, we have a number of research projects that we are currently um, advancing that's looking at first year retention by subgroups. Um, and based upon different sets of interventions that those students are engaged in, we have limited learning communities, we have a, a boot camp that some students participate in, and as of the last two years, all incoming freshmen um, are, are taking our freshman seminar course. We've been able to see some, some very um, significant increases and retention amongst our first year students over the last couple of years. We've also seen some good um, um, retention rates amongst um, our minority students. We've been looking at course um, instrument development to look at the transition to college, uh, measuring sense of belonging, um, looking at peer group interactions, um, study skills, and their self-regulated practice. We integrate into this class or the instructional model includes an, um, an instructor of record, a faculty member in one of our disciplines, along with peer mentors who are undergraduate teaching assistants who serve as role models within the course. And so for the peer mentors, we do a lot of looking at their leadership de development, communications, skills development and the like. And then we also do assessments with our instructors to um, get their perspectives on student engagement and their mindsets towards student success. I can share that this currently, this semester currently, we have 37 sections with about 1,200 students engaged in this course. And so this is how we are trying to blend um, research in this area with, with practice. Uh, using evidence to guide our design, but also using evidence to guide our refinement and, and learning what's happening with our students as we move along um, with this process. We also have um, a PI of a STEM project, which is funded by the National Science Foundation, which is aimed at students with financial need. Um, our source project is designed to support economically disadvantaged science and math students as they enter into undergraduate curriculum and persist to obtaining science and math bachelor's degrees. Beyond financial support, um, our scholars, uh, well, our program serves as an incubator for advancing the adaptation, implementation, and study of evidence-based curricula and co-curricular activities that promote the recruitment, retention, and graduation of students in our areas. Um, we have a research project that is focused on understanding um, the impact of high um, impact evidence-based retention and student success practices on the intersectional population of low income academically talented students. And so we seek to understand how these intersectional groups from low in, um, income backgrounds are developing identity and connecting to the scientific community. Our project um, is seeking to investigate the extent to which the attitudinal, cognitive, and behavioral outcomes of our participants differ from those students who are not participating in our program. 
Um, and we're looking at social capital and agency um, that they're developing also. Uh, we have an additional effort that we're leading. Uh, we call this one Style Aid Student Champions for Inclusion. Um, for this one, we're specifically working on demystifying career pathways and options. Within our disciplines, we prepare students primarily for graduate and professional school, and those are phenomenal pathways, but we also know that we, we, we have some students from, from the, our studies, we've been able to identify that we have some students that exit those pathways, our, our degree pathways, when they do not see readily a career option that doesn't include them going to professional school or graduate school immediately. And so we're starting to delve into some of that um, to, to pursue them being able to learn more. Um, and so for that group, we have a leadership learning laboratory where they learn about a host of different things and build their ability to collaborate effectively in a team environment amongst other kinds of skill sets. We have a number of outreach programs um, that have largely been funded by Halliburton and internal resources. Uh, we started it um, being called um, Go Science for Girls and we expanded it to go science explorations. We have three signature programs that are a component of that. Um, story time, which is very similar to story times uh, where a student, where we will read a story focus, a STEM based story. Um, and that's usually read by scientists. And then we have students that then will participate in um, experiments instead of um, a craft. Girls Day at the Museum targets um, girls grades four through six in our, our laboratory targets students um, in the um, seven through eighth grade. And we do assessments primarily with our parents getting their perspectives on, on some of these um, interventions um, for the, the, that age group of those age groups. Um, and that's an, an interesting and amazing thing to do. The last project I'll share with you um, is our project that we have focused on faculty. Um, and so we were recently funded for an advanced catalyst project um, where we're, we are seeking to use communications um, and our human performance technology model to understand the university micro um, climates experienced by faculty and using communication studies to, to message text, to be able to effectively communicate a strategy going forward. So charting communi um, strategic communications through organizational change processes. Um, we are, are currently initiating this effort um, and are looking forward to how this will develop and impact our university in terms of, of promoting gender equity within the faculty ranks. All righty, and so a lot of this work's been done in collaboration with um, our College of Science Task Force on Undergraduate Education, our Site 101 Course Development Team, our Advanced Internal Working Group. Um, I partnered with our Dean on a, a host of these, these activities. Our Communications Director actually supports a lot of the outreach activities. Um, and then we have graduate assistants and staff persons within our office um, that support all of those efforts. Um, I will share that all of the efforts that we shared, that I shared previously are efforts that I'm personally leading or um, am um, a primary co-lead on. And so there's a, a breadth of work that we are engaging in both to utilize evidence-based practice to design interventions, but also um, in um, refining practice and thinking through how we are consistently improving what we're doing um, so that we're more effective with our outcomes. Thank you so much uh, for everything. One of the themes that sort of emerged is how complex these investigations are from uncovering these factors to designing interventions that will account for these factors. And so one of the questions that was posed um, to us was, how do you make decisions about determining an appropriate setting for carrying out DEI research? So when is it appropriate to do it in a primarily white institution or a minority serving institution? And how might that impact your data collection and analysis? Uh, 
Um, I'm happy to, oh, go ahead, go ahead. No, you go ahead. <laughs> I'll just I'll just quickly say that I work at a primarily white institution and I recently got a grant from the National Science Foundation to study students of color. And in that grant and in this project, we're specifically looking at the context of being at a primarily white institution, which we which we theorize will be different than if the students were at, uh, you know, an HSI a Hispanic serving institution or, or an HBCU or or another MSI. So I think it's just about you can do DEI work in any setting. It's just about understanding the setting that you're working in and then analyzing your data within that context. Um, so I completely agree. I've been in, um, I've worked in um, PWIs. I've also worked at MSIs and conducted this work in, in across the different institutions. Um, I think that this work has to be pursued with a lot of grace, humility, and openness. Um, you know, I think there's a whole lot of value of understanding your positionality, regardless of which institution um, or institutional type that you're in. Um, and so then let, let me throw this out in, in a slightly different way. So, you know, the institutional type is not so big of a deal, but the positionality I think is an even larger or even larger deal. And so what do I mean by that? As a researcher, it's, it's very important for you to understand your privilege in the midst of these questions that you're asking. Um, it's important for you to understand your positionality as either an insider or outsider to the group that you're studying. It's important to understand how structural systemic discrimination may be impacting the groups that you're, you're looking at. It's important for you to understand your biases, whether conscious or unconscious, and the power and privilege that you have in the research process as both researcher and reporter of findings. Um, and then with humility and a very critical lens, adjudicate the design of your research study, interrogating the questions being asked and the lens through which you're advancing your study. For those who have a, a very decided social justice um, kind of slant to your, your scholarship, there's um, quite a bit of consideration to thinking through those that, you know, that, that component of, of the researcher's positionality. Um, and, and even with, as relates to privilege and systems of, of reward and how that impacts the researcher and the study. I wanted to share with you all um, a, um, book chapter in Research Methods for Social Justice and Equity in Education. Um, within that book, Laura Parsons shares that um, social justice oriented research, she shares that researchers in this vein should seek to improve the lives of marginalized and minoritized groups and that that scholarship has a very powerful role in illuminating what those lived experiences are. And, you know, I, I started off by sharing the lived experience of a student in a research group. And so the premise is, is that the researchers can't really make recommendations to improve those lived experiences if they, um, and they can't really promote change if they don't really understand what the uh, marginalized groups are challenged by. You don't have to be a marginalized group to understand what that experience is, but you have to be very careful about the questions that you ask and how you're framing up those questions. And it can seem simple, but the nature of those questions, the positionality of, of the researcher then can influence the nature of how those marginalized groups are studied. Um, and so I just think it takes a whole lot of vulnerability in this process, which isn't necessarily required when we're doing education research in general, but I think for these types of questions, it, it requires that. But for those of us who have a great passion for this work and wanna do great work, it's, it, it's so powerful to be able to make a significant impact in this way. And so um, the work is extremely needed across multiple institutional types, but I just caution us to think through the positionality of our researchers as we're asking questions and answering questions. Y'all are setting me up for these next questions like perfectly. 
So for people who don't have very much experience on top of positionality, who don't have experience in DEI research, um, how do they build uh, capacity in this area? And can, can people build capacity in this area, even if they don't have any background? I, I, I'm, uh, I, I would just say, um, you know, for, for universities and colleges, fortunate to have centers for teaching and learning um, to really perhaps draw upon resources that might be available um, through that, whether it's professional development or just you know, reading lists that they might uh, reference. Yeah, I will quickly say, Alina, that, you know, the short answer is I think you can, but I think you, you, you can with a strong dose of humility, right? So, you know, if I spend six to eight years doing uh, quantitative methods, trying to understand seagrass ecosystems, and then I'm trying to apply methods from sociology and philosophy and anthropology to understand human behavior. Um, you know, one of the, I think, beautiful things about a PhD is that, you know, it sets you up to be able to actually go and learn new methods and be fairly good at it. But you also do have to respect the fact that there are thousands and thousands of people who've been doing those methods. And in that field, decades before you decide to dip your toe in that water, right? So, you know, collaboration is essential. And, uh, you know, I, I'm humble enough to reach out to people who, uh, in that space to give me recommendations and, and have them help me guide where this study needs to go and how I need to look at this data or ask the kinds of questions. But it doesn't necessarily mean I exclude my research program from using those methods to address those questions. So it's, it's an interesting dose of being brave enough to, to, to take those methods on and try to learn those methods. So I think, yes, you can, but especially in societies that run the journals where those kinds of studies will be published, they're looking for a little bit of pedigree. At times it comes off as elitist, but I think at, at, at most times it really is, you know, th this is not playtime, right? Like if, you, if you're gonna write about this and, and take this on to answer this question, you're gonna have to come correct. And I think that's a perfectly fine thing. So um, that, that balance is, is an achievable one, but, but it's a good one. I would add to that to hire people in your department that are specialists in this kind of research. You know, people that do this kind of research and that came up through graduate school doing it. Uh, oftentimes we have a really hard time finding faculty positions because we're seen as not being biology enough or physics enough or chemistry enough or engineering enough. Hire us. Um, I, I so agree with all of the, the comments um, so far. So. Um, so I'll tell you what I did when I saw this question. I googled scientists changing careers and, and, and research areas. And I did it because I wanted to see what was out there and, and to just really think through what the, the, the question asked. People do it all the time. Um, if, if you were studying malaria and wanted to move to cancer research, what would that process be like? Similarly, I think um, the process for moving to DEI research, you know, there's a process for it. And so um, Anne Barry, Brian, and Malone um, have all shared like components of what that process is, is could be and should be like. Developing the collaborations is, is extremely important. Hiring in talent is really important. Thinking about how you're going to add to your research skills and your research toolkit. Um, I think is very important. Um, but there was a component to this question that um, I've kind of been thinking through and ruminating over. And it's this idea of what is rigor in research, and particularly what is rigor in education research. And, you know, coming off of a meeting with a colleague, um, just a couple of weeks ago when we were talking about conducting interviews of, of um, students from underrepresented groups who participate in international research and a set of research questions related to that um, and what the impact of that experience was like in terms of their identity and development of their identity as scientists. 
And my colleague who I respect so much said he did not want a, a paper of anecdotal evidence. And, and, so, and so one of the challenges in thinking through um, these questions about the move over, it's, it's certainly about the mythology, but it's also about the credibility of the mythologies amongst your colleagues. Ramon mentioned hiring people that do this work. And, and part of the challenge is, is when you don't fit into that solid quantitative box or you're wanting to do education research and you're not there, you know, you're trying to really understand that lived experience that we talked about. Like, so if race is a social construct, gender is a social construct, how do we study these constructs without studying their lived experiences? You know, it, it, it's extremely challenging. And so, um, you know, I think the, 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 the use of and, and the, the requirement for us to embrace qualitative and mixed methods um, in terms of having tools to advance our knowledge of these social constructs are, are incredibly important. But there's also quite a bit of advocacy work that I think is necessary in terms of, uh, of us advancing our understanding within our disciplines of what rigor looks like when you're doing important work and asking very challenging questions, sometimes questions in areas that people aren't comfortable with dealing with in the first place. Um, and so you got uncomfortable questions with uncomfortable research methods. Um, and so, you know, I think folks should enter into this and build collaborations, both for navigating the research mythology piece, but also for navigating that other side of making sure we understand what rigor looks like. Um, I think you have to go into it with eyes wide open with that plan of developing that network of colleagues and allies um, who are engaged in this work. So how have you all responded when tasked with defending the rigor of your work? How much time we have? <laughs> Not a lot. So, well, uh, no, I'll, I'll be brief. Um, no, it's, it's a really good question, and it actually builds nicely on that last question and ties to, to Ramon's point um, because I, I've had to defend it. Um, I, I think what perhaps was helpful was even when I went. In Ryan, I think you cut out at the worst time. So, and so if you, um, a herpetologist knows. Uh, has Can a I cut you of, off and have you repeat? <laughs> I'm sorry. You cut out for a little bit there. So take it from oh, the top. I'm so sorry. No, that's all right. That's all right. Um, <laughs> be like a director on a movie set, right? Um, there are times, hopefully it works this time. There are times when I've had to defend it. Um, but I think I went into the position knowing that I would have to. Um, so when the questions came about what is a qualitative method and please upload a qualitative methodology paper on your annual review, it was annoying, but I did it and we pressed on. <laughs> um, and I think, you know, one of the, you know, I'll just, I'll take, I'm taking an optimist view here. One of the joys of this work is we are so passionate about where this could lead, the lives it could impact, the changes it can bring about in, in education at whatever level, that the questions that come in about rigor and quality and stuff, honestly, they don't know what they are. That, that's going to happen if people are unaware of this area of scholarship, then there's a little bit of a defensive posture where you kind of feel the need to justify this person as being an equal. So we, we play that game, we let, let those questions come, we answer them as they, as they appear. But we press forward and publish what we publish, right? and I think I think it's worked out to take just a, a, a you know put the blinders on and move forward approach. Did I cut out on that? So I'll just jump in quickly. You know, yes, we often have to defend our work. Uh, qualitative work is often accused of being anecdotal, um, but I guess our defense is sheer numbers. Um, you look at our, our studies, um, we generally have 
very large numbers. And this, in our talking about leading study, 346 interviews, I think was uh, the total there. And students are not, you know, conspiring with each other to, to tell the interviewer the same thing. Um, these are individual accounts that are told again and again and again, and we can document them in our text and, and count them across our data set. Uh, so it's not anecdotal, it's, it's data. You know, when I would flip that question actually back at you and I would say, Polaris wants to say hi, sorry. I would say, <laughs> how, do, how do you defend your discipline-based education research peers, right? How do you get the full professors in your department to come out swinging for chem ed, bio ed, ethnographers, DEI people? And then within chemistry education, how do you come to the defense of people that do DEI work, right? You know, so I, I would put it back on you. It's not about us always having to defend ourselves. You know, we need allies. So, um, so I will say, I usually just put blinders on and do what I'm gonna do, um, and and um, and it and it is well. So I think that there are a number of metrics that convince our colleagues that we're doing credible work and. Um, um, and so I pursue multiple metrics um, because that's the name of the game. Um, and I try to do good work. And if you didn't like that one, that's okay. It was valuable and I really don't need to justify it. Um, but I think what's important, really extremely important is developing ad, um, allies and advocates and your network knowing that there's going to be a moment when we as a community need to defend each other. Um, um, and so because of that, if you are the long ranger, it's difficult to, to be in a position to have that. And so that's one of the reasons why I think it's incredibly um, important to, to build up your connections and to have um, um, a good group of folks that you are bouncing ideas around with, but that, that that's also supporting you and that you're supporting others. As we try to build out what this research looks like within our discipline, as we try to um, make visible some of the things that have been invisible, and as we ask very difficult question, questions with methodologies that some of us are not necessarily comfortable with. I want to shift uh, to a question that someone posed that I think is really great, where they wanted to revisit the point about developing valid measures across that are actually representative. Um, and one of the questions was there's some barriers, including time and having access to all the populations you would need and sample sizes you would need. Um, to do that kind of validation work. So I'm wondering if you can speak to addressing those barriers. You know, I think, again, I, I always throw questions back. So, so don't, I'm so here don't mind me too much. <laughs> but if, if we were talking about, you know, developing a traditional scientific experiment where we were trying to measure something, um, we wouldn't necessarily say, well, it'd be difficult to figure out how to actually measure that. So we're just not going to do it. And instead, we'll do this computational model that estimates it, right? We wouldn't say that. Um, but I would say that's a glib answer. But I would say a more direct answer would be uh, if you're using something like in physics, we use the force concept inventory. I'm, I'm sure you have uh, equivalent stuff in chemistry. If you're using those tools upfront, talk about the limitations of them, right? And you can talk about Historically, we have seen this gender divide. We don't actually know if this gender divide is real or if it's an artifact of the instrument. However, we're going to use this instrument because it's what we have. So I'm not against using instruments because they exist. I use the force concept inventory in my courses. I recognize that there's a gender bias and I don't read into that. You know, And then I would say, you know, go with like uh, Dr. Wilson Kennedy's route and what Dr. Hunter did and what Dr. Dewsbury does and do interviews and actually get that in-depth data because even if you can't go out and do a representative sample of a, of a new you know, concept inventory, you still can talk to your students, right? And you can use qualitative methodology to really dig at those, those underlying things. 
So I would ask, I would look at your research question and maybe and maybe uh, reconsider your methods if, if the tools at hand won't work. So that's my answer. I, I would only add that, um, you know, I, I, I'm not against, you know, like Ramon said, I'm not against uh, these kinds of tools, but I, I will say that sometimes I, I, I have a, internal resistance sometimes when when i hear questions like that because was, in in this in my field there's been a, a desire i feel for a lucretian skyhook right a, a a thing that when applied to a research question or when applied to a situation can explain a broad variety of things in so many different contexts at so many different institutions so so again it's, it's not that i'm saying never use these measures and that you can't validation is not a possibility but I'm so in tune with the nuance <laughs> and perhaps a lot of my interest is in the nuance that I, I, I'm, I'm less concerned about, you know, what the biases the instruments have and more about getting what individual stories are. Um, and I guess that that's just what ties to my research questions. So uh, I'm just kind of putting my bias out there <laughs> as to where, where I tend to go with that. So actually, can we flesh that out a little bit more in terms of nuance, uh, or maybe in addition to nuance, what are other theoretical considerations, assumptions, positions that uh, factor into this work? Was that back to me or the whole panel? <laughs> Everyone. I took a two and I'll pass it. Well, certainly this this really looked, it, it, it throws into relief the systems, the larger systems that need to be examined and that sustain and perpetuate a lot of inequity. Um, so we, we need to join, you know, from the bottom, you know, this theoretical from the top down and from the bottom up, we really have to start joining in the middle um, to make these differences. And then what about methodological considerations? So like you all have all said, we draw on methods that weren't developed within these domains specifically, like we draw from sociology, anthropology. So what are some considerations when using those methods for this work? You know, I think a big one that we, we really need to improve upon in discipline-based education research is we don't use a lot of theoretical framework. So oftentimes we come at research without having some sort of schema to understand what we're doing. So like I personally, historically, I drew a lot on uh, feminist scholars of science and also like Bell Hooks, Patricia Hill Collins, Sandra Harding. Donna Haraway, and I'm trying to break a little bit more into the critical race theory stuff with some of the, the new research that I'm going into. So I try to bring in those philosophers and intellectuals and form a theoretical framework on how I look at the methodology. And I think that that's one thing that uh, oftentimes can be missing in our work. And it's, it's, it's certainly missing a lot of the quantitative work because it's not even the mindset I think some of those studies go into it, into their work with. Right, um, and to, to maybe even throw the question back at you, Alina, it, it's, it's almost not so, I don't see it so much as using sociological or psychological frameworks to this work. I just see it as using sociological frameworks, right? It's, you know, depending on the, what the question is, it's just a sociological study. So I'm not, I'm not trying to take it and kind of adapt it to something. I'm having my colleagues who are sociologists kind of advise me if I'm thinking about this framework, how do I go about exploring it in this context? Um, just to quickly circle back to your question about nuance, you know, one, one thing, just one example of, of a nuance that complicates a lot of things, um, you look at a, 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 a population of students in a class and you might just say black, um, what if half of those students are immigrants from Africa? What if some of those students are people like myself who came from the Caribbean? Um, our collective history is a little bit different, our, not, our sense of belonging is different, in some of my one-on-one -on -one interviews, what they say to me about belonging is very, very different to what an African-American born and raised in Providence, Rhode Island might say, right? 
you're not going to get that if, if it's just a category that just says black. Um, uh, in terms of framework, you know, the frameworks are really helpful. You know, psychology has their issues too with the whole weird stuff and the reproducibility crisis and things like that. Um, but, you know, at, at the base where, you know, the idea is you're just trying to understand how humans behave, um, how they interact, how they form social structures. Uh, you know, we kind of start off looking at a lot of the social belonging and wise interventions frameworks. And now given the times and given some of the things that are coming up, we get into surveillance literature and, and uh, um, science and technology studies. And that's, that's just like a whole other rabbit hole. And again, they have their methods, right? So we, we are learning and collaborating and then using those to help frame what the appropriate questions are. So it's, it's not really so much an adaptation. It's, it's a, you're learning and using. That makes complete sense. That makes complete sense. Um, so we're coming towards the end of our time and I wanna make sure that if you have any sort of final thoughts that you have a chance to share them. I, I just wanna wish everybody safety. I uh, hope you are uh, sick, uh, sorry, not sick, not sick. <laughs> and um, uh, your family members are safe. I mean, it's a tough time for everyone. I mean, you're trying to do like the same jobs and the same life in a very stressful time. So I just want to be cognizant of that and I wish everybody good health. One of the, the things that I've struggled with um, being a practitioner, so I, again, scholarly administrator, an administrator that, that pursues scholarship, and understanding what's happening with the, the interventions that have been developing. Is that even in the midst of that, that quote unquote diversity work is often considered service. And the fact that it's actual scholarship um, is a point that I think we need advocacy for, understanding and a development of its impact and understanding our discipline and what's happening with student learning. You know, it's not that this is the service part of Deaver. This is core to Deaver, and so um, so I would really, you know, want to advocate for us advancing the scholarship related to this um, and these types of questions and problems, um, both the scholarship and our advocacy. Of I, guess I would just say, um, you know, based on coming from the perspective of, of the talking about leaving, uh, which, which was published 20 years ago, and talking about leaving revisited, uh, which was just published, you know, we've, we've been struggling with these issues now for at least 20 years. But we now do have the research discipline and the data to show how the ways in which many systems in higher ed continue to exclude students um, that we really, we don't have excuses anymore. We have the means with software to do the research to show the students that we're losing, where we're losing them, why we're losing them. And we need institutions to take the responsibility to gather and analyze these data um, and not to ignore issues of inclusion and equity because they shrug it off as not their responsibility. It is. Thank you.